nothing on us hey. nothing on us hey. it's on box up god is up gorilla warfare in every lifetime we don't take no shit except an oppressor's lifeline if you step out of your line i will protect what's mine kahit merong rosario sino maglilikas sa'yo puro dugo pungkut ulo mulat sa dagat hanggang mo to proclaim it was ours the high and the low these women are gods you already know we're steeper than water the rain in a village the river runs red you'll be dead in a minute like never spend nine just have you be headed fuck with my tribe quickly regret it abani ko sa kamay at isang mikropono sabay at ang tapang ko kaya nang inay at halimaw nang sumasabay mga baran yo lahat sablay mga rappers na puro bangkay tinamaan ko lahat patay kaya walang mag-iingay I got that Filipino phenotype Kay you mangi mestizo white But give me that moreno like That roofie your Aquino type My lolas they be speaking like Those Bali songs and bolo knife I read the ether need no hype Two tongues are sharper with the mic I need no in my history like From a land where greed is weaving tight They thieve until one piece of might Just turn to see no see no light Hacienda like Aquino right Rodrigo vigilante type They kill my titles left and right With smoke and mirrors filled the night So let it be known, if you don't already. Penais have always been part and parcel, if not imperative and critical to the struggle. Filipinas are no strangers to wielding our own power. Of all the privileges that exist in this world, none of which you may be a benefactor of, there is at least one you bear, and that is the privilege of having been born a Filipina. Your DNA contains building blocks made from the mud of over 500 years of resistance and survival. And when you are ready, sis, we'll be right here. Right here, right here. Island woman dies, walang makakatigil Brown, brown woman rise, alamin ang yung ugat They got nothing on us, nothing on us Nothing on us, nothing on us Island woman rise, walang makakatigil Brown, brown woman rise, alamin ang yung ugat They got nothing on us, nothing on us Nothing on us, isang bagsak Yeah, 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 send it better. So chalk and a saram. Soon me out in a saram. Nan and not a saram. Nan and drone saram. Man and not a saram. Chunk and got your gun, say, yeah, yeah. Doing young, not a saram. Tadu Saragachi, yeah. Tadu Saragachi, yeah. Tadu Baragachi, yeah, yeah, yeah. Chuck the chee, yeah. Saram didn't be on a chee. Not a bionet to she. Why so serious? Why so serious? Why so serious? Mm -mm -mm. I'm so serious. I'm so serious. I'm so serious. I'm so For joining us today, hope you enjoyed our our intro music. Looks it looks and sounds like you did. <laughs> so welcome everyone to our our event today. We're so excited to have you all here. 
Um, I'm Song V. I'm part of staff at Eastwind Books, um, and we're super excited to have all of our readers and other Eastwind staff members joining us here today with you all. So uh, for those of you that don't know, Eastwind Books is an Asian American and ethnic studies focused bookstore that's in downtown Berkeley. We've been around for a little over 30 years now, I think almost, and we're hoping to be around uh, for many more years to keep supporting you all. Um, I'd also like to thank DVAN, the Diasporic Vietnamese Artist Network, for co-sponsoring our event today. They're an awesome organization that also does a lot to support Vietnamese and Southeast Asian American artists. So thank you, DVAN, for all of your support as well. So we are so happy to, to celebrate this SASC anthology. I know it's been uh, a while since we've had a SASC anthology. So I'm super excited for you all and proud of you. So I'm glad we get to celebrate all of your hard work today. So welcome everyone. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Anvi and Alisa, our two editors, and I'll let them share a little bit more about the anthology for you all. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Envy. I go by she, the he pronouns, um, and I am currently an incoming fourth year at UC Berkeley. Um, and also, I was the former Southeast Asian Mentorship Director under the Southeast Asian Student Coalition and the chair of um, the anthology program under the Southeast Asian Student Coalition. Um, so yeah, I kind of just wanted to give everybody like insight on what the anthology was, how it came to be what it is, and um, kind of just the history of SASC and the anthology. So in the year 2000, Professor Kataria Um hosted a critical refugee conference and her students that attended the conference um, kind of realized that they needed a space where they could talk about these, these uh, issues and um, you know, advocate for their community. And so a group of five or seven students came together and created the Southeast, sorry, the Southeast Asian Student Coalition. Um, and from there, um, programs have grown out of it, like the Southeast Asian Mentorship Program, the annual um, SASC SI or Summer Institute, um, our Southeast Asian Prison Outreach Project. Um, you know, the list goes on. And part of that was the anthology. So in the year 2007, um, Dr. Kataria Um, Associate Professor of the Asian American Studies at the University of California, Berkeley, brought forth a project for the Southeast Asian Student Coalition that focused on documenting the stories and memories of first generation Southeast Asian refugees through creative writing. At the time, Southeast Asian narratives were highly underrepresented. Professor Um and the SAS community wanted to create something that would stand against time, something that would keep our and our ancestors' stories alive, both in and outside of the classroom. Um, so that is how the anthology came to be. Um, unfortunately, within the last couple of years, we haven't been able to publish an anthology. I think the last one that was published was 2016. Um, and so this is a very exciting year, especially because this year marks the 46th anniversary of the Southeast Asian diaspora. So um, yeah, that's just a little bit of a background. And I'm gonna pass it over to Elisa. If you wanna talk a little bit more about your experience. Yeah. Um... So I was Envy's second pair of eyes for the anthology. Um, I mostly just helped with punctuation and fixing like some minor um, typos and whatever, uh, just because everybody's work was so great. I didn't want to really touch it too much. Um, and I actually learned about the anthology through Jen, funnily enough, who was my dorm mate in UC Davis. Um, she had posted something about um, the SASC mentorship on Facebook. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to really, um, yeah, be a part of that. But then she forwarded this Ask Anthology to me because she knew I was a writer and she's an artist. So thanks, Jen. Um, yeah, and actually through the anthology um, and through Envy, I started working at Eastwind. So just really happy to be a part of all of this and um, learning new stuff every day. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, did you want to? Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, um, so um, now that we've kind of introduced ourselves as editors, we'll both be reading our pieces to y'all, um, and then we'll be passing it on to the rest of the contributors. 
Um, so I'm going to go first. I have three pieces I'm going to read today, um, two of which are poems. Um, and they're, uh, they're two poems that are supposed to be together. Uh, <laughs> I'm really bad with words right now, sorry, but you get what I mean, um, hopefully. But um, just to introduce the poems first, um, the first part is called For Me. And I wrote this actually when I was roommates with Riss. Uh, we lived together for a little bit. And um, there's this one night where Riss shaved my head <laughs> after I begged her to, um, because I recently came out as, well, not recently, I guess, like last October, I recently came out as uh, gender fluid. And it took a lot for me to come to that realization and accept it and like share that with my loved ones. Um, and the moment that, or my hair was a really big part of like my gender dysphoria. And so I just needed it to go in that moment. And um, this is kind of just my little uh, reflection on that time of my life. Um, but here we go. Hearts around me are pounding and so is my own. There's a plastic bag ever so slightly cushioning my knees, but it's not enough. They still hurt. My feet and hands are tingling as chaos erupts around me. A symphony of Zoom calls, video games, and jumbled voices saying, yes, no. Is the midterm too much, too much? Tomorrow we will. My pupils are dilating and my palms are growing sweaty and thoughts of uncertainty are rushing to my head. I want it, but I'm scared. What if it's not the right time? But urgently, a voice in my head whispers, but if not now, when? My lips are dry and sticky with stale milk tea and grass jelly residue on them. Riss yanks my ponytail and everyone's eyes fixate on me. I sip my boba more urgently. I don't feel much, just gentle pulling. It's the sound of the scissors that get me. Every snip breaks a chain. The reliable daughter, the gender dysphoria, the doubt, the hurt. I feel it slowly falling to my feet, poking at my skin as if begging to be let in, but I resist. I refuse. Everything becomes more vibrant. And then um, part two is called For You. And this is after I moved back home with my family. Um, I had to move back home because of you know COVID and stuff and uh, I couldn't really afford rent anymore. So, um, you know, being a child of refugees, moving home is a very interesting experience, <laughs> especially after moving away to college and finding yourself. It's it's a uh, it's interesting um, to say the least. So here we go. Winter is here, like the life, like the leafless trees. My head is hairless, but just as freeing as it feels when shackles are broken, I too am liberated. I am free from the confines of gender and culture. My nose has more than two holes my ears more than four. I guess I can smell and hear better. The, win the winter may be winter, and baby, it may be cold outside, but not here, not in my heart. My heart is a growing fire, my soul is warm. The source of my serotonin and dopamine are limitless. It's infinite. The sky is no longer my ceiling. I'm here, I'm me, and I love that. Nothing can stop me, is that true? Nothing can stop me. Nothing can hurt me all. Can hurt me at all. Nothing but you. Không giống ai. Mập như heo. Con có thương mẹ không? Tháo cái đeo bông ra mũi ra đi con. Ngoan đi nghe lời mẹ. Mẹ thương. Nhưng mẹ thương ai? Who do you love? Who do you hurt? Am I me or am I who you want me to be? Am I for you or am I for me? Who can I be? Is there a me or is there only you? Who gets to decide? Who gets to hurt? Who gets to cry? Who do we mourn? Who has to die? Um, so if you can tell, I wrote, I read a little bit of it in Vietnamese. Um, so I'm gonna translate it. Um Yom Ai is like kind of something that my mom tells me a lot because I'm pretty out of the box, but it just means that you're like, you're not like the rest of the people, but in a really, really negative way, like, oh, you you look like ridiculous, like what are you doing? Um Nhu Heo is like, you're fat like a pig. Uh is like, do you love me? Like, do you love me enough to do this for me? Um, is like, literally like, please take out your nose piercing. It's pissing me off. <laughs> um, is like, be a good child, like, listen to me. 
um, mẹ thương is like mommy loves you like just you know do what I need you to do um, nhưng mẹ thương ai is like my question for my mom was like who do you love like the version of me that you want me to be or the version of myself that I actually am so um, yeah that was for you and for me or for me and for you sorry and then um, yeah so that was just my little identity piece and then I have a short story that I would like to read to y'all um find it in here okay this is called and then what and then what I asked what do you mean she looked at me curiously I mean is that it I pressed well everything settled after you were born I'm not sure what you want me to say she chuckled I couldn't help but hope there was more or that there'd be plans for more. I stared out the window at the children laughing, holding their cups of nook me. My own mouth started to salivate as I pondered how it tasted on such a hot summer day. But I started, still looking out the window. Don't you wonder what's next? What lies ahead? I asked, looking back at my mother. Her eyes were tired. They were brown, but not the kind that were so dark you can't differentiate between the pupil and iris. They were the kind that reminded you of a dark cup of coffee mixed with condensed milk. They were the kind that were glossy, the kind that, the kind that you could get lost in. They were the kind that you looked into for comfort. Nevertheless, ne sorry, nevertheless, they, looked they were tired. You'd think they wouldn't be as tired as they are, seeing the lines surrounding them signified years of joy and happiness. When looking at my mother, you might think, she looks fulfilled but looks can be deceiving. Those eyes have seen too much. They'd witnessed the death of their creators, both by the hands of greedy capitalists. They'd witnessed the drowning of their, own, their owner's only blood relative, the owner of a similar pair of eyes, her brother. Those eyes pleaded to unsee, to not remember. She smiled a sad smile at me as she returned to her work, organizing the dipped powders on the shelf. There weren't any customers today and she looked easier to she looked eager to close early. It was the Thursday before that, and she couldn't wait to, to help make loads of bunchen. She couldn't wait to pray to them. Why are you asking me about, all, about this all of a sudden? You've never asked before, she asked. It's just, they talked about the war today. I stared at my shoes. And they kept talking about us as if we were monsters, mom. It hurt and it's confusing. I'm not sure what side I belong to. What do you mean? I mean, I'm American, right? Of course, you were born here. You're an American citizen. Yeah, but I'm also Vietnamese, right? Of course. Why are you asking such strange questions? I bit my lip and continued, ignoring her question. Right, so I'm Vietnamese, but I'm also American. Which side do I choose? Am I the American soldier that went to kick Vietnam's butt in order to preserve democracy and fight communism? Or am I the evil Vietnamese that threatened democracy and prosperity? Or worse, am I neither? Where do I belong? My mom chuckled. No, nope, you're thinking about this too hard. Am I though, mom? When I was in class today, the teacher and my classmates turned to me when they talked about the war. I was still looking at my shoes, which were now kicking the stool to keep my emotions at bay. Right, probably because they know you're Vietnamese. Right. But when I visited Vietnam with you last summer, they called me American. Right, because you were born here, she tried to explain, exasperated. But that's the thing, mom, don't you see? It doesn't matter where I am. There's no place where I can be whole. In America, I'm the dirty Vietnamese they had to kill. In Vietnam, I'm the American who knows nothing about her culture, language, and country. No matter where I am, I'm not enough. I don't belong anywhere. It was quiet. All, you, all that could be heard was the sound of the oscillating fan. Costco advertised it as silent. Costco, you dirty liar. So what are you trying to say? My mom asked, her voice shaking. What? I whispered, my eyes shooting up at her. She was crying. Come to think of it, I'd never been vulnerable with my mom and expressed my thoughts and emotions like this to her before. No, I don't understand how you feel. Ông Bang Lai, Gao Hui, and I risked our lives to escape Vietnam for a better life, and I was the only one who survived. I came here for a better chance, for a good future for you. 
I never imagined you'd complain about that future like this. Did you think that we wouldn't have problems after you settled? After you found dad and had this family? I forced out. I wanted her to know. What problems? A stable education? Not living in constant fear of being shot at every five minutes? Being able to walk around your neighborhood without worrying about landmines? What problems? Well, she said. I could tell she was forcing too. Mom, I trail off. I didn't know what to say to that. So you're having an identity crisis. You don't know where you belong. Jeez, no, at least you get to live. At least you and your brother can still hold each other. At least you still have me and dad. At least you're safe, no. You're safe, you're stable, and you get to have a choice. I didn't, no, I didn't. She's yelling now, tears streaming down her face. I wanted to tell her it's not just an identity crisis. I wanted to tell her that the thoughts that float, are, float into my head at I wanted to tell her the thoughts that float into my head at night. I wanted to tell her how hard it is to breathe when she and dad tell me their random yet painful memories when they get drunk every so often. I wanted to tell her that although Hung and I can hold each other and see each other, we don't know each other. It's too painful to try. I wanted to tell her how hard it is to get up in the morning, how when I get to school, it's hard to focus or find the drive to do anything, how my mind races when I see the water or my heart thumps a little harder and faster when I hear the sounds of booming drums. I wanted to tell her that this identity crisis is a genuine fear. What happens when I grow up and have my own family and my own kids? What happens when this pain, these fears, these nightmares don't go away? What do we do? So we're settled, so we're stable. For now, what happens when we're not? And then what? That was uh, my short story. Pass it on to Elisa. <laughs> Thank you. That was really good. <laughs> okay. Uh, so my piece is just kind of about um, my family's immigration stories um, and like the sacrifices that they made um, coming here. Um, it's actually about my dad and he's here. So really excited for that. Um, all right, so I'm gonna start reading. As a second generation kid of Filipino immigrants, I encounter a lot of cultural clashings or interminglings between my American and Filipino roots. This one day is when I learned more about the talk stories that my family passes down to me and the way that I can feel so small and swamped in history in a single family out of the millions in America. It is the root of my narcissism that my parents love me intensely and that they have a fiery passion for success from all that they have sacrificed to give to me. It is also the root of my insecurity where I will never be enough to say a hunger for safety and stability running deeper than bone for over my 23 years, as every generation passes the desperate resilience to me, in silence brimming with listless and watchful waiting. Earlier the same night I had spoken to my cousin, I was sitting at the table when my dad came in at around midnight. He seemed happy after drinking at my uncle's house. I had two burgers on the table from going to in and out My brother was sleeping on the couch. Whose burger is this, my dad said. It's nobody's, take it, I said. I had bought an extra just in case anyone wanted it. Christian, there's a burger, my dad said. It's okay, dad, you can eat it, I said. I was partway through my own burger. Are you sure, he asked. He was eating some of the fries. Eventually I convinced him my brother wasn't going to be getting up and told him to have some of his burger. But then I'm gonna be too full, he said. My dad had gotten into the habit of not eating full regular meals despite working hard manual labor for a job. My dad is a technician. He may not always be working with heavy ass cars the way he does as a hobby, but the way that he comes home and sneaks away to the back with a couple of beers somehow showed his exhaustion clear as day. In the past month or so, my dad had maintained a slim physique, but I worried as this was not a healthy nutrition plan. It was unreasonable for him to work himself to the bone when it was unnecessary when he could work himself to the average BMI instead and retain some comfort. He acted as though it was not too hard a loss. Ate, if I quit my job, will you help me, he asked. Ate was the word for sister in Tagalog, which my brother called me often. It was a nickname, kind of, more like an honorific that my parents used often to encourage my brother. What, will you help me? Panic rose inside me. With what, with groceries, with bills? My dad laughed. Everything, will you help me? 
I was confused. He was drunk though, and I didn't really know what he meant. I ate more of my In-N-Out burger. It was an ordinary cheeseburger, which was all I was comfortable with. I never got the double-double that my brother was fond of. Work is getting stressful. What happened, I asked. There was this new guy, and you know, I have an accent. Label, you know what that is? Label? I thought he meant on a bottle. See, you don't understand me even. Label. Eventually, I realized. Level, I said. Yeah, level, my dad said. My dad probably needed the level to install machinery property, properly, and a new guy, more of a novice than himself, who had worked at the company for 10 years and risked his other job to work there, had the nerve to challenge his accent. He couldn't understand me. It made me so pissed off. He was so rude. I was confused. I had just done the same thing that this stranger had done to my dad. My dad didn't seem angry at me. I guess it was about the specifics of the situation, though. Is there anything else that has been stressing you out? My dad explained that there had been a lot of work lately since the pandemic started. He said that the driver wasn't going to transport some oil container because it wasn't his job anymore. My dad couldn't tell his manager about it, but rather had to transport the thing himself and install it alone. It seemed like people weren't communicating about the changes in workload, and my dad was doing things out of his job description. I'm sorry, dad, I said. It's okay. He looked at me. I just want you to be successful. All right. I'm going to stop there, but thank you for listening. Thank you, Lisa, and also Envy for your pieces, too. You all are so good, like, and like following, and it's great. <laughs> okay, um, I think we have our next reader is Anastasia Lay. Take it away, Anastasia. Anastasia, are you here? Okay, I'll just go ahead and start then, sorry. Um, uh, this is um, Offerings to a Silent Mother. Guilt sounds like organ pipes, an instrument that pairs well with Vietnamese devotional music. On Sunday afternoons, mournful basses and tenors refrain as the sopranos try to reach the limits of their vocal ability without popping off the buttons of their AI. The rest of the congregation follows in a comfortable range, which is more a chant inflected by our language's accent than a melody. From above, the organ surrounds us. The pews vibrate, lulling us into a stupor full of unanswerable things. What is the purpose of suffering? Where are people taken from us? How did we all get so far from home? I listened to the priest Barrage's intercession in an indiscernible dialect. I learned my prayers in English. Glancing over, I see my mom singing something familiar under her breath, and I wish I knew the words. Daylight's arc wavers, knuckles soften like candle wax in knowing hands. Thank you, Thank you Anastasia. All right, I think our next reader is Jennifer. I know Jennifer, uh, you have an image to share, so we'll pull that up right now. Uh, hello, can everyone hear me? Yes, okay. you're good. Great. Um, hi, uh, my name is Jennifer. Uh, I am a traditional and digital artist. Um, so my contribution to the anthology is a painting of the ox, um, which uh, this year um, we did celebrate the year of the ox. And it's also um, my year because I was born in 1997. Um, 
and it also represents my identity as a Vietnamese American. Um, uh, so in the art piece, the ox is surrounded by peach trees um, blooming with bright pink flowers and red lanterns. And the words on the lanterns translate um, to the words uh, happiness, good fortune, and peace. And then we have the uh, ox wearing a red sash, translating Happy New Year in Vietnamese. And uh, it's wearing a conical hat around its neck and holding uh, one of my favorite desserts to eat during um, the New Year, just the glutinous rice ball filled with mung beans. And it, it's also sitting in like ginger syrup topped with coconut cream, toasted sesame seeds, and minced ginger. Uh, and in addition, there's also a Vietnamese butterfly at the top left. And at the bottom, there are chrysanthemum flowers, which are very popular during the new year. And the colors bright red and yellow or gold are believed to be the lucky color and help bring good fortune. Um, I also base the butterfly off of um, the cabbage eating caterpillar, which is commonly found in Vietnam. And while I was working on this piece, I thought about how um, the butterfly represents the presence of our deceased loved ones watching over us. And so they get to celebrate the holiday too. And that's it, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. That was beautiful. Um, all right, next we have CB. Um, I'll share a little bit. So, um, a little sh a short story. Um, it's called Simon Wang Um And yeah, I'm not sure how much time there is. I can share like an exact excerpt, but just like, just talk about a little bit of it. Um, yeah, it's like, to me when I was writing it, it's like a, it feels like a, a Vietnamese American type of thing, like, oh, like, I was actually like learning different languages, like Vietnamese and English, and like, uh, so there's some Vietnamese in there, and there's some like, some little humor about learning Vietnamese, or like not being able to speak Vietnamese as well, and so we were at that, and there's a lot of like dynamics of like a brother and sister dynamic, of like, oh, like conflict in that type of sense, and um, it's kind of a sci-fi sci type of thing, time travel, I'm like, oh, like, going back to the past to fix the future, and stuff like that. So that's something that I, like, wrote about, um, and it's it's a very, like, dramatic story, like, there's a lot of things that come back up again, and so, yeah, it's more of a time check. Just curious more time is. Um, it should be good. I think about four or five minutes, that's okay. Yeah. Um, I'll just read like the like a little bit from the first chapter. So the first chapter is called Promises, and it starts off with some dialogue. And so first Simon says, Brittany, hurry, there isn't much time. Simon is just a prototype. I don't even know if it'll work. Just do it already. If I can go back to the past, I can fix things before it's too late. I don't want to lose my one and only brother, Brittany cried. I'll be okay. We'll come back soon, I promise. Brittany activates the prototype of her time machine and Simon's body shakes and he loses consciousness and, bre and breath. As the smell of ring or durian fills the room, Brittany cries, Simon, no. And there's a skip. Simon, although barely conscious, hears a mysterious voice call out, Jo Duc Ben, come, come I, Jo Duc Ben, which means you can cure like an illness, but you cannot cure like your destiny, or change your destiny. And so suddenly Simon is surrounded by an ocean and calls out Brittany before he fully submerges into the water around him. Some time passes and he, he wakes up, he screams, Brittany. And he says, what? Simon looks around as if nothing has changed at all, changed at all. Although he feels different, he looks into another mirror and is surprised by his younger reflection staring back at him. Wow, I feel like I'm 18 again. I guess the machine did work after all. I've got to tell Brittany. Simon checks his phone to try and contact Brittany, but there's no trace of her existence anywhere. What, Brittany? 
He feels his phone vibrate in his pocket and he gets a text message from an unknown sender. He opens the text for it only to appear as an indecipherable gibberish that suddenly transforms into a message he could read. Simon, if you're reading this, that means my time machine worked. I don't know if this will even reach you or if you can reply. I have attached the blueprints from my machine in this text. Please come back to me. Love, Brittany. And that's all I read for now. That's a little teaser of the beginning. And yeah, it's a story of trying to get back to Brittany. That's like the sounds. Awesome. Thank you, Phoebe. I guess we'll all just have to, to grab a copy of the anthology if you want to figure out what happens. <laughs> okay. Um, next, we have Princeton. Hello. Um, my name is Princeton. I'm a rising senior uh, in high school at Irvine, California. And um, for the Sask anthology, I submitted like a series of poems, but I'll just read um, my favorite one. And this one's called Preservation. The history of my people is beginning to fade. The elders are emotionally scarred. It hurts for them to relive the war. Think what would happen if we stayed? Yet this is something that our generation must work around. We must realize that we must be wholesome to get to the dark answers we seek. Direct questions will only drag us down. Little steps are the only way. We need to ask questions that bring fond memories that lead into a dark hole where the answers are that you seek, the answers that you need to preserve the history of our people. And so this poem was basically about um, my experience as a Laotian uh, American and just um, what I encountered with um, really just talking to my grandparents about um, their history and just me trying to find out more about myself. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Princeton. Oh, Princeton, I'm sorry. Um, and last but not least, we have Riss. Thank you. Um, middle school. In my science class, there was a curriculum called Family Life, where teachers introduced children to the anatomy of our bodies, or more specifically, our reproductive parts. Towards the end of the concepts, the teacher showed a video of a mother giving birth and walked us mythologically through how a woman became pregnant. Female teachers taught female students and male teachers taught male students. To this day, I don't remember much about what we learned. I know we labeled parts of the vagina, but it never felt like we were talking about body parts that were on my own body. Instead, I remember the giggles of the girls excited to be solely around their best friends in one class and the boys complaining that they wanted to be in the, uh, the girls' class too. The girls with boyfriends took and sent pictures of the worksheets depicting the anatomy of the vagina to them. And those without boyfriends mostly texted each other from across the classroom. I remember sitting in the back I didn't have a phone, so I didn't have anyone to text. I learned though that if I had my head down, my fingers skimming the paper handout, the teacher would never call me, thinking that I was working. Plus, she always tended to call the to call on the girls on their phones, so I was safe. However, the classroom itself was in a safe space where I felt comfortable asking questions about my own body parts. I knew that my body didn't develop as fast as others, but I didn't want to ask why in the classroom and embarrass myself. Yet such was inevitable. In one of the discussions, there came a point where bra size came up. While I knew what a bra was, I didn't know my size. So when the girls in the row in front of me turned around and asked what my size was, I merely responded that I forgot. One turned towards the other and snickered that I probably couldn't fit into a bra. And the truth was, I didn't even own a regular bra. I only wore sports bras so that way when I ran cross country and track, I wouldn't have to change in the locker rooms in front of everyone. Knowing my body was underdeveloped was one thing, but the girls actually seeing it was another. Another point came up about periods and how long our ovulation cycles normally lasted. I hadn't even had my period yet and wouldn't have it till high school. But because nearly every girl had had their period in the room, they talked about their experiences for the first time bleeding. The earlier the date occurred, the more confidence seemed to bring for them. Before they could turn their attention towards me again, I asked the teacher to be excused to the bathroom. In family life, yes, we did learn about our reproductive parts, but I also learned that my body was behind in terms of development. 
I wasn't even sure why the curriculum was called family life itself. Did actions related to sex serve as a fundamental basis of a family structure? I wasn't sure and didn't think so. I didn't learn about other family lifestyles outside of my own and my parents' friends until high school. Until then, I felt lost and confused and ashamed of in my own body. High school. The first time I visited one of my best friend's houses in high school, I was legitimately shocked. Opened windows and pulled up blinds so that the sunlight spilled in, crayons and colored pencils sprawled lazily across the table, my friend's youngest sibling dancing around the kitchen and singing a song for her school play, colorful cups scattered across the main table. Outside in the backyard, a makeshift hammock swung slightly from the breeze, stirring up leaves in the ground. It was open and beautiful, mesmerizing. And it re reminded me of Sula's house in Toni Morrison's novel. And I told my friend's mom that. Then our conversation shifted to how the education system was meant to fail those who couldn't afford it from the start. And we talked about the income gap, the poverty line, and I've never had these conversations with an adult before other than my teachers. And this is because I've grown up modeling adults in the workforce as professionals who had reached their zenith. So having an open discussion with them seems to question their authority. This is because a slightest bit of disagreement in my household with my parents warranted punishment. Talking back, saying no, or you're even trying to simply set boundaries, that was all seen as a sign of disrespect in my family. Therefore, I was amazed that my friend could talk to her mother and father about her exes and current boyfriend, how he kissed her, how she met his parents, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, my mother didn't meet my father's parents until the day of the wedding. Of course, times are changing. Sometimes I feel as if my parents' cultural values have caused my upbringing to proceed slower compared to others like a rusted cog on one of the wheels of mainstream society plowing viciously forward. I didn't realize that difference was something to be celebrated until college, and I didn't realize that the public education system taught science, or more specifically biology, on a standard scale that mostly pertained to majority populations. And I didn't realize that my body didn't actually necessarily develop slower, but on average according to my mother, and my mother's mother, and her mother. I didn't realize the importance of a history passed down onto me and living within me today. I didn't realize the dangers of a single story being taught within a larger framework. And this is the problem of having a body born in America but does not feel American, and knowing that your body is not home to your cultures within a standardized system. Yeah, so I wrote these reflections because it's not just tests like the ACT, SAT, and GRE that are standardized, but also our bodies that are always first put on the line. And growing up a woman sometimes always felt like violence to me in itself. And this is why breaking the cycle of intergenerational trauma is so important to me so that I'm able to learn from my mother and her mother and her mother. And why I really now wish that when I first heard the the word intergenerational trauma, I also heard of the words intergenerational love and wisdom, um, just because our stories are so erased and yet that's what saves us, grounds us, um, connects us. So that's also why I write and why I feel like they need to be told, written and amplified, um, just because or else girls like me will always grow up feeling like a cultural charlatan. Um, so thank you for listening. That was amazing. Thank you, Riz. Um, I think you summed it up perfectly of, of what I uh, wanted to say about you all. Well, actually first, thank you all for reading. I wanted to give you all another moment just to love on each other and celebrate you because this is a huge accomplishment and your work and stories need and deserve all the love and attention. So, um, Yes, thank you everyone. Thank you for being vulnerable and sharing your art and your process with everyone. Um, it's really important and really awesome. So um, thank you for sharing. We're going to move on now to a question and answer session we have some time for. So if anyone in our audience has any questions for our artists, um, you can ask them anything. You can either raise your hand or you can use the raise hand function. And I can call on you if you would like to unmute yourself to ask your question. Um, another way you can ask a question 
is you can use the chat box. You can type your question there and I will read it to our, our artists for you and they can answer from there. So a couple ways to ask any questions too. Yes, thank you for the love. Um, so while you all are thinking of questions, I have a question. Oh, I, oh, I had oh a Harvey, question. do you have one? Um, okay, so the proposal to put it together um, was about a year ahead was it before we actually published it? And I, I was just wondering how did everybody come together, you know, to decide on what to do? And, and was there like a brainstorming, you know, to, for a, a focus for the thing or, or did it just kind of come together at the end? <laughs> yeah. I can take this question. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I reached out to Harvey, I think last June, hmm, I don't know, August maybe, um, uh. about publishing the anthology. And um, it was because we had a group that wanted to publish last year. However, mm -hmm. just with the whole, you know, the pandemic starting, everybody kind of just got a little bit busy and stressed out. And so we had to abandon the project. Um, and I was really bummed out and I was like, man, like I really wanted to publish something this year. And so um, I started working at Aposity, the Asian Pacific American Student Development Office. And I was talking to my boss, Mia, about it. I was like, I really want to publish something. Like, you know, this is the 45th anniversary, at the time it was the 45th anniversary. Like we haven't published anything in a really long time. Like we need to put something together. Um, and I know that a lot of artists in the community wanted to contribute too. And so we were talking about it and we were like, why don't we just publish with Eastwind? And I was like, we can publish with Eastwind? <laughs> and they were like, yeah, the um, APERG does it every year or something, or they, they publish the Mothers to Mothers um, through Eastwind, which is a, um, a community cookbook. Um, yeah, but I was like, I didn't even know we could do that. And so I, I sent to Harvey an email and I was like, hi, <laughs> um, would you wanna help me <laughs> publish this? I mean, we don't have anything set in stone yet, but I mean, hypothetically, would it be possible? And he was like, yeah, just, you know, get me the details and uh, we'll talk later. And so I started recruiting people. I started talking to my friends and I started, you know, just asking folks, hey, do you have anything you wanna, you know, put together for the 46th anniversary of the Southeast Asian diaspora? And um, all these lovely people came forward and they were like, yeah, I have something to share. And um, I didn't want to restrict them to a theme. And, and so we had a workshop or we had a, a series of workshops where um, Southeast Asian artists kind of just came in and like talked to them. Um, we had a poetry writing workshop, art. Uh, and then I forget the, I think it was like storytelling for one of them, um, a children's book. It was a children's book workshop. And um, yeah, so I was just like, you know, take these skills that you've learned and kind of just try to create something. And um, we'll find a theme together um, after your works have been completed. And so, yeah, that's how all of this started. It was just kind of a small idea and then kind of a drive for me to put something out there um, just to, you know, remind the community that we do have voices, we have stories and, you know, our needs, wants, concerns, dreams, hopes need to be shared because too often, especially on the UC Berkeley campus, we're not heard, we're not listened to. And um, yeah, I just wanted to remind people that we're here. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you, Envy and Harvey for the question. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I also wanted to remind everyone, I think everyone knows, but uh, SASC is completely student run. It's like young people in the community. They have mentors like Airbnb and other professors, but I love that it was your idea to put this together and you made it happen. So congrats again. <laughs> All right, any other questions? I think we might have time for one more question.
Well, I have a question. It's a should be a quick one. So, um, for all of you contributors here, do you have any advice for other uh, young Southeast Asian American artists who, I don't know, might be at the beginning of their journey and maybe not be as sure about their art or creating something, anything that you would say to them? Uh, I guess I have one, like write what needs to be written and you know, follow the questions that you have inside you. I can also add on to that. I would just say write because there is an audience, you know, there are people who will listen and read and want to learn from you and also feel home within like your words, you know, just because like we grow up not taught our history and yet having to ace those tests in the first place and get further disconnected from what we study so intensely. So when you write your own history and your own words, like there will people who will really want it and like I'm one of them too. Um, sorry. Um, in response to what Riz said, um, I also think it's good to write as if there isn't an audience um, in exploration of the self. I feel like that's something we don't often get to do, which is like to be curious about ourselves alongside like our history, which is of course something that we carry within ourselves. Um, so writing is certainly an invitation to be gentle and curious. I think for me, um, I leaned onto my friends, my family, and my community a lot during my writing process. I came into college really not knowing who I was, and my I was really confused about my identity and my culture and you know traditions, history, and that type of stuff. And so without my community and my friends and you know talking to my family about their experiences, I wouldn't have been able to write what I wrote about. Um, so really, just reconnecting with your history is a really big one for me. Yeah, I can share a bit. Um, yeah, like, like the practice of creating like art is a cyclical process. You can change and go back and forth. And sometimes it's like 3 a.m. inspiration. Sometimes it's like an afternoon inspiration. There's no like right or wrong set time to do it. And um, just seeing what feels right. And then prioritizing the elements too, because it's hard to like. Sometimes you burn out. Sometimes you just gotta focus on what you want to actually write that feels good for you. Um, for me, I think it was basically just I wasn't exactly like the form of art that I was going to choose. It was mainly what I was going to write about, and for me, that just took a, like a lot of reflection and a lot of just seeing what I'm truly passionate about as well as looking at memories that have really shaped who I am today. And so that's what's really helped me with um, choosing what to write about. And you know, once you find something that you're really passionate about, I believe that the, the words will really just start flowing. I think um, as long as you know what you're, about, or what you're gonna write about, um, I think writing is really enjoyable. It's really pretty easy to do. Uh, and I'd like to add on to everyone else that shared. Um, just do it when it comes to creativity. Um, yeah, just do it because uh, no one else is going to do it for you. Um, and if they do, they're just going to do it their way and it's not going to be how you want it. So just do it. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, thank you everyone for your words and your art. Um, I think we're 
going to wrap up now. It's almost time. But if everyone doesn't mind, could we take a group photo with you all? Yeah, okay. I think Erica, if you don't mind uh, taking the photo for yeah. us. If you have the anthology, I know some of you haven't received it yet, but you can show it off if you have it. Yay, okay, you all have it. <laughs> okay, everybody ready? Okay, one, two, three. One more. Another one. Okay, great. Yay. All right, thank you everyone. We hope you all enjoyed everyone's art today. If you did, um, please consider grabbing a copy if you haven't already of the Sask Anthology, The Blood in Our Veins, The Roots to Our Trees. You can visit asiabooksenter.com. We do, um, you can order for pickup at our store if you're in the Bay Area or we can also ship it to you. So either way works. But yeah, so thank you everyone again. We hope you had a good time. Visit our website also for other upcoming events if you enjoyed this one. Um, yeah, if anyone has any last words. If not, hope you enjoy the rest of your Sunday and we'll see you soon. Bye.